Welcome back. Lauren Keim here with the Introduction to Commercial Real Estate Training Course, Part 5. I want to briefly introduce you to how to finance those transactions you'll be doing with your clients. Financing is a critical component of your transactions and ultimately of your career. Most properties are financed and the availability of capital for financing directly affects your ability to sell real estate. How restrictive lenders are with their financing and how high or low interest rates are can affect whether or not investors buy or investors invest, and that affects value. Most of this you'll be able to read about in your manual, but there are a few areas I want to highlight. First, a mortgage loan can be viewed as both a debt and an investment, and a lot of agents have trouble with this concept, but it could be a debt or an investment depending on how a loan is viewed. The borrower considers a loan to be a debt against the property, something they want to pay off. The bank, on the other hand, or the lender, views the loan as an investment that they have invested in the property and in the borrower with a fixed return over time or with some sort of return over time. There's two investments in every loan against a property. I also want to mention the borrower's perspective versus the lender's perspective. The borrower usually wants to maximize the loan amount in order to leverage as much property as humanly possible because he or she wants to buy those four properties rather than just one that we talked about in part three. And the loan is viewed by the borrower as a debt that requires the borrower to make monthly payments for the next 15 or 20 or 25 years. The borrower's perspective is that he or she needs to make sure that the income from the property is higher than the loan payment and that spread between the income generated and the loan payment needs to be high enough that it provides the borrower with a great cash on cash return on their initial investment like we talked about in part three. On the other hand, the perspective of the lender is that the loan is an investment in the property and in the borrower that's going to generate a return on the lender's money. The lender may loan a property buyer $200,000 on a $250,000 purchase at a fixed rate of 5 or 6% for a period of 20 years. That lender is making an investment in that property of a $200,000 level, a $200,000 investment, expecting a fixed annuity from this investment of 6% per year. Whether or not the buyer ever gets a tenant in the building, the lender is due their mortgage payment or their return on investment that they've made in the transaction. The lender is also going to be concerned about the borrower's ability to repay and the strength of the investment property to carry that mortgage loan, whether or not the owner is still there. And because of that, lenders are typically uh, determined that a purchase with a significant down payment is going to be less risky than a purchase with little or no down payment. So should the lender need to foreclose on the property, a lend, uh, significant down payment will hopefully ensure the lender that they'll be able to sell the property for enough to recapture that initial investment. Now one of the challenges you're going to encounter in commercial loans and uh, are that loans requirements on the commercial side change regularly. They're not like residential loans. They vary from lender to lender. For example, you may find a lender with a private funding source who's going to loan 80% of the appraised value of a multifamily property with very few lender closing costs. Another lender across the street may have a maximum loan of only 75% of the appraised value and a very heavy fees. It varies from lender to lender. The loan process works similarly to that of residential loans. Although there are many types of commercial loans in a variety of lenders, most loans are processed in the same manner. There are several individuals or groups who touch a loan while it's being processed. The originator or loan officer takes an application and then initially pre-qualifies the buyer. This might be the manager at a local bank or it might be a mortgage broker working independently in the area. The originator collects the initial documentation necessary for processing the loan and in most cases passes that loan package onto a processor. And the processor or the processing team takes that loan package that was filled out by the originator and begins to determine what additional information might be required to approve that loan. The processor collects information on both the buyer and the property, including full credit reports, copies of leases, property appraisals, title reports, and financial statements, and then packages that loan together and submits it to an underwriter for approval. If the lender is a mortgage company, the processor may actually shop the loan to several direct lenders in order to find the best loan terms for the borrower. 
And then finally, the underwriter is the decision maker in this loan process. In some lending institutions, such as community banks, the underwriter might actually be a committee that decides on the loan's approval or denial. So, how do you qualify for a commercial loan? And this is a really tricky question. And many real estate professionals making that switch from residential to commercial have a tough time understanding it. In the realm of residential real estate and residential lending, most loans are standardized to certain requirements because the bank or mortgage company you're dealing with probably isn't loaning you their own money. They're getting paid to originate, process, and underwrite the loan, and maybe even service it, but it's not their money. A residential buyer might go to Big Bank of Gotham or Wonder Mortgages, and that buyer will receive a mortgage commitment and a check from Big Bank of Gotham or Wonder Mortgages, but the loan may be sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will then package those loans into mortgage-backed securities and sell them on the secondary market. Sure, you may write a check every month to Big Bank of Gotham, but that doesn't mean it's their money that you borrowed. Commercial loans are very different because the money loaned is often loaned directly from the bank. So when you get a mortgage from Metropolitan, Metropolis Savings and Loan, they're likely to be loaning you their own money. And in the interest in, of full disclosure, they could also sell their loans in the secondary market as well. But since the risk to the bank is much greater when they're loaning you their money rather than the money printed out of thin air by the federal government, they get more picky on what they're going to actually loan. The other concept that differentiates commercial lending from residential is that the property typically is more important to the lender than the borrower in qualifying. On a residential property, your income is the critical component in making that payment every month. In a commercial investment, the property itself might carry the debt. The borrower is certainly a factor, particularly if the commercial building is being purchased to house the borrower's small business, but the income generated by the building is often a greater factor. For example, if you're earning $120,000 per year and you're using money left to you by your rich uncle Sigmund to purchase a 20-unit building with a 20% down payment, your income is probably not likely to carry that $900,000 building or million-dollar building if it became vacant. However, if a lender is considering a typical vacancy rate of a multifamily building to be 5%, then 19 out of 20 units are going to continue to be rented, good market or bad, generating the income necessary to carry the debt. Whether or not you earn any income next year at all or whether you get laid off. Commercial lenders do re review the qualifications of a borrower, including credit worthiness, income, and particularly the experience they have in commercial real estate. But there are several critical ratios that a lender requires a property and borrower to meet in order to fund the loan. The loan to value ratio is simply the mortgage amount divided by the appraised value of the property, very similar to residential. Although LTVs can fluctuate depending on the borrower's experience, credit, and income, commercial loans generally require 20% or greater down payments. A 20% down payment, down payment is the same as an 80% loan to value ratio. The LTV equals the loan amount divided by the appraised value. Another way to look at it is the LTV equals 100% minus the down payment percentage. And again, different risk categories of property may also require greater down payments, uh, resulting in a lower LTV. Lenders may require purchasers of high-risk businesses such as taverns or high-risk industries such as coal mining to put more money down and prove their experience in operating that type of business. There is a second ratio, and that's called combined loan-to-value ratio, CLTV. See, historically, some borrowers have obtained financing from several sources in order to minimize their out-of-pocket investment in a commercial property project. Secondary loans might come from hard money lenders, or they might come from the property seller holding a second place lien. Hard money lenders, by the way, are lenders that provide much riskier loans at much higher required rates. Lenders are more comfortable making commercial loans if the borrower has some skin in the game, which means that if the borrower puts their own capital into the project, they are less likely to walk away from the project if times get tough. The combined loan to value ratio is the maximum a lender will allow the borrower to loan against the property from all sources combined. 
For example, if a commercial bank is willing to loan an entrepreneur or a restaurateur, let's say, somebody who's opening a restaurant, 70% loan to value, they want 30% to come from somewhere else. But they have a second restriction of CLTV, combined loan to value ratio, of 80%. The borrower might borrow 70% from the commercial bank and an additional 10% from a secondary source, such as the former restaurant owner, but they have to have 20% of their own capital invested. So the formula is CLTV equals the amount of every loan combined, amount of loan 1 plus amount of loan 2 plus amount of loan 3, divided by the total purchase price or value of the property. And of course, we also talked uh, two sessions ago about debt service coverage ratio, DSCR. So I'm not going to cover that, but basically it's net operating income divided by annual debt service. Now, I do want to mention a couple of things on types of lenders. I mentioned hard money lenders a few moments ago. There are lots of different kinds of commercial lenders. And commercial mortgage lenders come in every variety, shape, and size. They range from large commercial banks and insurance companies to private individuals who invest in trust deeds. Uh, the line between various types of lenders often blurs because mortgage brokers tend to use a variety of sources to find loans for their clients. Unlike residential lending, where every major lender can provide virtually every type of loan, commercial lenders pick and choose what type of property that they'll loan on and what credit profile they'll accept as a buyer. For example, some lenders will loan on commercial farms. Some will simply avoid them. Some lenders will make loans in bars or taverns. Others will not. Lenders make decisions on their commercial lending practices based on their understanding of risk. And there are lots of types of loans. There are many forms that uh, commercial loans take. I might highlight a few here. A purchase or acquisition loan is pretty self-explanatory. A blanket loan is a loan or mortgage that covers several properties owned by the same party. Uh, blanket loans are often used by banks to cover several commercial properties owned by the same individual. They're used by developers um, who buy large tracts of land to develop into houses. And blanket mortgages allow a borrower to pay off portions of the loan and have portions of that property released incrementally. There are also development or subdivision loans. There are construction loans. There are refinance loans. There are cash-out refinance loans. There are subordinate loans. And that's a loan that's in a second place or third place position. In the case where a borrower already has a mortgage against a property and requires additional funds for repairs, renovations, and other purposes, a lender may make an additional loan on the property. These subordinate loans are generally at a higher rate than conventional mortgages. There's also the SBA loan. The Small Business Administration loan is designed to assist small businesses with 50 or fewer employees to finance a higher loan to value ratio than is typical in order to help a business start or grow. An SBA loan is actually two loans that are made by a private lender. The first loan is made for 50% of the value of the property and the second loan is up to 40% of the value and may be by the same lender or a different lender. Only the second loan is guaranteed under the program. Now because SBA guarantees the loan the risk to the lender uh, is lower to the lender, who is then willing to uh, more willing to lend. So restrictions on SBA loans uh, include that the borrower or the borrowing firm has to have 50 or fewer employees. It can't be used for big business. The firm or business may not be a media-related business or a business engaged in gambling, lending, investing, recreation, or nonprofit. Sorry to all you lenders out there. And the borrower must occupy a minimum 51% of the property being financed. <clears throat> a couple other quick loans. A mortgage participation mortgage, a participating mortgage, is a commercial loan in which the lender shares in part of the income generated from the property or from the project. So the lender still receives their mortgage payment, but they'll also receive a share of the income from the property or a percentage of sales proceeds if the property is sold. And mezzanine financing. Mezzanine loans are usually used as a secondary or supplementary financing for real estate development projects. The money is provided as a loan to the company, but it's collateralized by stock in the company or some other equity instrument. So if the borrower defaults, the lender might exercise warrants or options built into the contract to convert the outstanding debt into an ownership share. 
Mezzanine debt, by the way, is of lesser priority than a commercial mortgage that may be in a first place position against the property. So the interest rate is generally higher to account for that risk to the lender. And loan applications for commercial mortgages are similar to residential, but they do have some additional detail. Although every lender is different, most require standard information about the borrower and the property. Personal and business information, property information, and business information are all important to this process. Personal and business information is the usual tax returns, bank statements, uh, personal financial statement, a schedule of real estate holdings, and a year-to-date profit and loss statement for any business ventures. They're also going to require a personal resume and specific information on management of any property or any business that can be related to the property that you're purchasing. And then property information is a profit and loss statement for the property you're buying. They're going to require a copy of the prior owner's most recent two years tax returns. And this can often be a challenge if the prior owner doesn't want to release what they believe is their private information. But they need to understand that lenders require it in order to fund the loan. They also need a rent roll, a unit description of the property, copies of leases, property insurance information, and if the property is retail tenant occupied uh, or office tenant occupied, the lender might require financial statements on the tenants. But one of the bright sides is that if the tenants are very strong, the lender may give the borrower more favorable terms on the loan. And then business information, if purchasing or starting a business, you want a resume of all management experience, a business plan and a full explanation of that plan, business projections, copies of franchise agreements, and an outline of competitors. The next level of understanding commercial financing is to understand the risk profiles lenders use in their decision-making process. As I've been repeating, all commercial lenders will not lend money on all types of property. One lender may have a specialist that handles commercial farms while another lender uh, handles senior care facilities and lends to those borrowers. Commercial lenders pick and choose the types of products they offer and the property types they consider. For example, most commercial lenders are willing to lend on multifamily properties because these properties are generally considered to be very low risk. If the borrower is strong and has experience because uh, residential multifamily housing has a predictable vacancy rate, and tenants are relatively easy to find, they'll loan them the money. And that translates into a lower risk for the lender. A small steel mill that's leased to a single tenant has a much higher risk profile. If the tenant vacates the property, it could sit vacant for an extended period of time and may force the owner into a default situation where the lender has to take back the property. They don't want to do that. Industrial properties also carry the potential risk of contamination. Fewer lenders will take the risk on this type of property, and lending criteria and levels of acceptable risk do change from one lender to the next. The last thing I want to mention on our short time together in this section is the difference between fully and partially amortized loans. Fully amortized loans are similar to residential. They're amortized over whatever term the loan is. 15 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years. And each payment is equal, but each payment will apply some of the money to principal and some to interest until it's paid off, with most of the early loan payments going primarily to interest. As the loan period moves along, more of the monthly payments go to the principal of the loan. Partially amortized loans are made in equal installments also. However, although the amortization may be over 20 years, the term is shorter than the amortization. So there's generally a balloon payment of some sort during the holding period. For example, you might have a loan amortized over 20 years, but you have to pay off the balance or refinance it in year 10. Now an example is on the screen. We're comparing a fully amortized 15-year loan for 250000 to a partially amortized loan that's also amortized over 15 years, but it's requiring a balloon payment in year five. So the borrower is given a 1% rate reduction for those terms. Again, the bank doesn't want to tie up their money for 15 years if they're concerned that inflation might drive the rates higher. So they're willing to give a lower rate in order to have a shorter term. And in this case, it's saving the investor almost $200 a month 
or $12,000 over that five-year holding period. And still, at the end of five years, they're going to owe less on the five-year loan, on the 15-year amortized loan with a five-year balloon, than they would if it were fully amortized. At the same time, they're going to, at that point, have to refinance that loan, go out and find another lender, or find a way to extend it. I want to thank you on joining us on Part 5. This is a shortened version of Introduction to Commercial Mortgages. And we'll be seeing you at Part 6, where we talk about the practice of commercial real estate, prospecting, listing presentations, and much more. I look forward to seeing you then. Again, this is Lauren Kime. Thanks very much.